Hello, so this is the third talk on level one models, and today we're going to focus on high pass filtering. So make sure you're ready. Um, do you understand what the convolution with a canonical HRF means and how we use that to create our regressors in the level one design matrix? If not, go back to the level one models, the canonical HRF lecture. Okay, so where were we? So last time we didn't try to improve our model at all. I was just talking about FIR models, but so far we've done this. We started with the horrible boxcar regressor, and the this is the Y hat in red, Y in blue, and the yellow was the residual, so remember that. So using the boxcar is not great because it doesn't properly adjust for the delay in the um, bold response, the blurring and the delay of the signal. So our t-statistic was 3.55 to start. Then when all we did was just add in a convolution with a double gamma hemodynamic response function, which is the most commonly used uh, canonical HRF, the residual is greatly improved, the fit is better, and not only did our numerator increase because now the regressor was able to um, fit the peak of the bold signal better, but the residual variance decreased a lot. Um, so it went from 1.41, the standard deviation, to 1.22, which contributed to a t-statistic increase of quite a bit. And again, this last chunk here, this 0.06, this is the contribution to the variance from the design matrix, and this remains uh, fixed for most of this. Okay, so what are we gonna do to fix the model today? Well, we're gonna focus on the noise. So I don't know how many of you have looked at power spectra before, but it's a really handy way to view the noise structure in your data. So here I'm showing you white noise. White noise time series just means I randomly sampled data from a normal distribution to create the time series. So the bottom is the Fourier transform. I'm not going to go into that probably for a while, if ever. So if you're not familiar with the Fourier transform, you can look it up. But basically all it is, is it's a representation of your data in frequency space. So x-axis here is frequency in hertz, which is 1 over seconds, and the y-axis is power. So if the power is really high for a frequency, it means that that frequency is present in your data. And what this power spectrum is showing is that all frequencies are kind of equally present when you have white noise. On the other hand, with bold data, with signal, um, there's two types of structure here. We have the signal structure, and there's also low frequency noise. So this peak here is showing us that there's a high um, uh, presence of low frequency drift. Uh, this peak here corresponds to the frequency of the task. So this isn't showing us bad things, it's showing us good things too. And then um, there's this issue called aliasing. Um, I'm not gonna talk about aliasing. But basically the power spectrum is telling us good things about our signal and then bad things about our noise structure. So there's, they call this colored noise because it has, a, it's not white. So there are certain frequencies that are stronger than others. What about this drift? So this is the time series I showed you before. This is a real time series from bold data, and you can definitely see it's drifting. It's not because the brain was working harder here and less hard here, but various things contribute to this drift. Probably the biggest is head motion. There can be cardiac noise, respiratory noise, scanner noise, all sorts of contributions cause this drift, and we can't stop it. No matter how well you pad your subject, they're still going to be breathing and doing other things, and the scanner does what it does, and you just get these issues in your data. So this is a really good paper. This is one of the first papers I read in grad school, and one of the things they did is they're trying to figure out what's causing this noise. So they did the most common sense thing, they plugged in different equipment to the MRI, used different computers, and no matter what they did, they still saw this 1 over F structure in the power spectrum, so this is in Hertz. These are just the uh, power spectra for different subjects. And always this structure prevailed. Um, right, so 
it's there, we can't stop it, so we better model it out of our data because going back to the goal, our goal is to get that residual as small as possible because that will make our, that means our model fits better and our t-statistics will be improved. Here's a really beautiful power spectra. Um, it's because it's averaged over principal components or something, something that specifically brought out uh, the specific components or the specific parts of the signal. So there's the low frequency noise, that's what we're gonna to tackle today. This breathing artifact that's aliased and that's the cardiac effect, if I have that right. But yeah, so those we're not gonna worry about um, today. We're gonna to worry about that low frequency. So there are two things we do. The first is high pass filtering, the second is pre-whitening. Today we're only gonna talk about high pass filtering. And I'm going to talk about uh, the types that FSL and SPM use, and AFNI, I believe, also uses what SPM does, which is a discrete cosine transform basis set. FSL uses a Gaussian weighted running line smoother, which is much simpler than it sounds. So um, the high pass filter simply hacks off the low frequency noise. So you are just removing it. So that's important because if you're going to hack off that frequency, you don't want your task in this low frequency band. You don't want your task there anyway because there's no way to differentiate from your stimulus and noise, right? So SPM and AFNI use a discrete cosine transform basis set. So you can see here, it's just a set of cosine functions of various frequencies. And you choose the frequency up to the, basically the frequency you wanna remove. For FSL uses, and these are just added as regressors to the design matrix, and they will remove the drift. And this is what I actually use in the illustration in a minute, so you can see it at work. FSL, on the other hand, they don't add something to the model. They actually apply this filtering both to your design matrix, you know, the regressors in your design matrix and the data. So that's this Gaussian weighted running line, line smoother. So the pink line I'm showing here is the actual um, Gaussian weighted running line. All it is, is at each time point, you take a weighted average of the data, the yellow data. Uh, the weights follow a Gaussian distribution. That's the Gaussian weighted part. So you just take a weighted average and that gives you the value on the pink line. And then you scoot it down and do it at all the time points. So this, you can see this pink line shows us what the drift looks like. It's high and then it goes down and it dips down. And then all you do is you subtract that pink line from the yellow line and you get the cyan line here. So it's nice and flat. You see it brought down the uphill portion in the beginning and this little downhill chunk in the middle. So that's the second step is just to simply subtract. Um, and you must apply this filter both to your data in the design and when I go through the FSL steps later, I will show you where you do this. Basically, you have to keep the apply temporal filter box in the design setup checked. Otherwise, your data and design won't match. Uh, part of it is the reason you want to do that is it gives you kind of weird things sometimes like this little uphill chunk. This doesn't show so much if you have an event related design but you wanna make sure that any weirdness is present both in your data and the design. And there are other reasons why. You, if you do anything to your data, you wanna make sure to do it to your regressors too. And here's the result in the frequency domain. So before is up top, after is down below, and you can see it just hacked off all of the signal in these low frequencies. So again, if your signal your task is really slow. If you have a really slow block design, um, you're in trouble because your signal is gonna be mixed in with this noise. There's no way to pull those two apart. So I compare this to taking a piece of yellow Play-Doh and a piece of blue Play-Doh and giving it to a child and the child smushes them together and it turns into green Play-Doh. And then the child gives you the Play-Doh back and says, you know what, can you turn that back into blue and yellow Play-Doh? You can't. Once they're, they're smushed together, they are smushed together forever. Same with the signal. So avoid really long block designs. Don't have a subject do a task for 40 seconds on, 40 seconds off, or something like that, because then you're in danger of your signal getting hacked off by your high pass filter, or just your signals mixed in with this noise. 
So your filter cutoff, you want it to be high, but not higher than the paradigm frequency. Um, look at the power spectrum of your design, and you can base your cutoff on that. I think FSL has tools for this. Block design, you want it longer than one task cycle, usually twice the task cycle. Event-related design, larger than 66 seconds. Again, you can look at the power spectrum of a canonical HRF for a single response. Or, not again, but that's based off of uh, canonical HRF. Typically, um, in FSL at least, I currently use 100 seconds, which is lenient, because the second part that I'm going to talk about next time, pre-whitening, kind of cleans up what's left behind. So I'm going to be a little lenient with this stuff and allow my uh, pre-whitening to pick that up. I'll talk about that more later. So the high-pass filtering removes the worst of the low-frequency trends. So here's a really dramatic linear increase. You high-pass filter it, and it's fixed. So time series, top, frequency domain, bottom. Um, so it's important to think about what these filtering strategies do to your signal. So here's a black design. So this is the uh, proposed or the assumed signal that would be produced. This is the power spectrum of it. There isn't any noise added to this. So it's a really beautiful power spectrum. This is just aliasing. If you low pass filter, which I haven't talked about, um, this is fine. Uh, if you high pass filter, the signal is fine as well. So low pass filter gets rid of high frequency stuff. So we just lose some of these chunks where the aliasing occurred. The high pass filter passes high frequency, so we just remove low frequency, but there was nothing there anyway. So um, block designs are fine for the most part with both types of filters. Um, and by the way, if an idea of a low pass filter, you could, you could think of it as that Gaussian weighted running line smoother, but that is your filter data. It's just smoothed over time and you lose the wiggliness. So you just do the step where you get the, the weighted fit and you stop there, you don't subtract it. Anyway, I'm not gonna go into different methods of low pass filtering, uh, but I am illustrating what it does to the data. So here's um, a high frequency signal uh, with regular spacing between the trials. Here's the power spectrum, low pass filter. It actually zapped some of the signal up here uh, but otherwise it's okay. The high pass filter is much better off. We didn't lose this um, frequency band here, didn't get affected. So this is the same thing. It's an event related design, but with jittering between the trials. This is one of the more, at least for the people I've worked with, this is typically what they use. So here's this power spectrum. And you can see the low pass filter is really killing the signal. There's good signal up here in these um, higher frequency bins and it's getting zapped but we retain that using a high pass filter. So because of this, since the low pass filter does run the risk of removing important signal, we very rarely use a low pass filter on task fMRI data. Resting state data is a different story. It's much more common to low and high pass filter resting state data. So low pass filtering, the idea is to swamp out high frequency noise, easily removes the important signal in event-related designs, um, then you want to, of course, choose a cutoff to remove your noise, but avoid your signal. So we just typically don't use low pass. We always high pass. We always have to remove this low frequency drift. And so because of that, we avoid designs with low frequencies because we always high pass filter. Okay, so know the difference. It's almost the reverse of what you think it is, unless you, I don't know, high pass. You just have to remember you're passing over the high frequencies, keeping See, I got that wrong. Yeah, getting rid of the low frequencies. Maybe I just get those mixed up. Right, and we do not low pass filter task fMRI. So here's the model. I'm gonna use the DCT basis set. So I now have a lot more parameters. You'll notice I don't have a column of ones in my design matrix. Um, I'm using kind of the FSL approach, which mean centers everything. Talk about that more later. But anyhow, beta one's the parameter of interest, that's for my stimulus, the rest are just nuisance. They're just there to remove this drift. So the contrast I'm using is this one right here. So the predicted signal I'm gonna show you is actually based on all these things. So it's the product of these two matrices. 
So there it is. So now you can see my fitted uh, Y hat, the fitted bold response, can curve around. It's more flexible. This T statistic is for the contrast I just showed. So the Y hat here corresponds to the full fitted model. The T statistic is just for beta 1. The activation magnitude dropped a little. You might think that that's horrible, but that's because previously this high drift portion in the beginning was stretching the Y hat up higher than it should have been. But now that it can curve and fit to the drift, the estimate is actually where it should be. So basically it was too big before and that was actually a bias. It was being biased by the drift. Our residual variance is much, much lower. And this part here, again, I said this isn't going to change much and it isn't. So even though our uh, estimation of the activation magnitude dropped, the residual variance dropped even more, so the net effect was that the t-statistic increased. So here it is in comparison. You can see the residual variance is just way smaller in this latest fit. So make sure you understand what are the two methods of high-pass filtering that I just showed you. By the way, if you want the FSL version, you can ask me. I have MATLAB code that can do it using just a simple matrix multiplication. And know how much you should filter your data. You have to make this choice. Don't necessarily go with the default in the um, fMRI analysis software you're using. Make an educated decision. Be an educated button pusher. That's what this is all about. Thank you very much, and have a great day.